No. So I need to know if all those people in the back with very young ears can hear what I'm saying. We're good. We'll try to keep it that way. As I've been asked by the committee or whoever it was to lead the entire meeting, I have to tell you I'm afraid that you're stuck with me the whole time. But we'll see what we can do. Uh, let's begin by singing Psalter number 383. 383. Last verses of Psalter 3 speak of the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit to search us out and to correct us and instruct us in sanctification. Prayer is the exercise of God's sovereignty in all our sanctification, expressed so beautifully and clearly here as a prayer and having God accomplish that work in us gives glory, praise, and thanksgiving to him alone. Let's sing all the stances of 383. Next, let's sing Psalter 38, 38. Praise of God's law, and praise of God's law is a guide to our sanctification. We note the fourth and the fifth stanzas. His heirs who can know, cleanse me from hidden stain, keep me from willful sins, or let them o'er me reign. We sing the five stances of Psalter 38.
Let's come before God's throne of grace in prayer. True and living God, our Father, the God and Father of thine only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we rejoice to come to thee in and through his name, his name that is lifted up and exalted above all names, the names that the name that thou hast declared and given to us for our salvation in all its glory, in all its fullness, in all of its abundant riches. And we thank you that thou hast given to us a perfect and a complete and glorious mediator in whom and by whom is all our peace with thee. The removal of all enmity, the removal of all thy wrath as laid upon him as he died for us on the cross of Calvary, to work full and complete reconciliation, to establish the full ground of every blessing of our salvation from beginning to end, to make all our way gracious through trial, through difficulties, through the deep and great struggle against sin, to the victory and the glory of thy everlasting kingdom. We praise thee. We glorify thy name, as thou art the author and the finisher of this great salvation through thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And we give thee thanks that we might be gathered in the fellowship of this blessed salvation in this conference. And we thank thee that we might devote ourselves in this conference to glorifying thee and praising thee, the God who dost sanctify us by thy word and through thy Holy Spirit that we might give our attention this evening to a certain aspect of that great and glorious work of sanctification, and that as we grow in our understanding and knowledge of this blessed and divine work, that observing and knowing its fruit within us, our hearts, our souls, our minds, our lips, our fingers, our eyes, and our ears, that we might in all of it give thee praise and humble thanksgiving for thy great work of salvation. We pray that thou remember us as we consider what thy word has to instruct us regarding this great wonder, this miracle of our sanctification. Grant us humility of heart and mind to receive this truth, that sanctification is holy and altogether thy gift, given to us in every respect of sheer, pure, sovereign grace, that we might be strengthened together to praise Thee and to glorify Thee who art the God of our salvation. And as we recognize this day our struggles against sin and temptation, as we know how far woefully short we have fallen of Thy glory, we pray for Thy mercy and for Thy grace. Forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us of our unrighteousness with the blood of Thy Son, Jesus Christ. We pray, turn us by Thy word and spirit from our wicked and our sinful ways, Turn us to Thee, to love Thee, the Lord our God, to serve Thee and to glorify Thee for all that Thou hast done for us. So all this we ask and all this we pray in Jesus' name alone. Amen. Uh, the scripture that I've chosen for us to read this evening, although I'll be treating a great deal of scripture in my lecture, is John chapter 17. John chapter 17. The reason I chose this passage is because our Lord Jesus Christ mentions in his high priestly prayer his own sanctification before the Lord God his Father, and that as the ground for our own sanctification, as wrought in us by him, our Deliverer and Savior by his Holy Spirit, but also that this is a prayer, a prayer that is assuredly answered by God, for the sake of the merits of Jesus Christ fully and completely, and that we have in John chapter 17 a model or an example of the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ continues to pray for us before God's throne of grace every day at God's right hand for all our sanctification. That prayer that must be heard, and that prayer that must be answered solely for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, who prays it at God's right hand, based on his own merits. So keeping that in mind, let's read John 17. 
These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. They have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. So far we read. The topic of my speech is sanctification and the Holy Spirit. It is my goal this evening to draw such a close relationship between those two, according to God's Word, and that Word in your hearts and souls by faith, to know and understand this one thing. All our sanctification, from beginning to end, is the product, it is the outcome of the working of God, the Holy Spirit, alone. Alone. It is one thing to say, the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. 
It is one thing to say that the Holy Spirit in sanctifying us, enables us, equips us, makes good works possible, helps us. But to say in the last and at the end that there is still something that we contribute denies this truth of sanctification. For to be truly, indeed, sanctification, it must be the work of God the Holy Spirit and the work of God the Holy Spirit alone. All his work from beginning to end. And there are two ways that I want to make that evident in the very beginning of this lecture by looking at the very term itself, sanctification. Sanctification. What does that word mean? Well, that word is made up of two parts. The first word is simply the Latin word for holy, corresponding to God, the Holy Spirit. It is that the holiness of God, the Holy Spirit, must be solely the outcome of the work of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit alone is holy. We also look at the second part of that word sanctification, which is the Latin word, simply to make or to do. To make or to do. The particular use of that word to make or do in connection with this word sanctification or simply holiness indicates that it is a work that is performed upon us. It is work that is wrought within us, of which we are the objects and of which we are the recipients. Thus it stands in harmony with the blessed faith that is wrought in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that we receive this sanctification. And that reception of sanctification by faith is entirely in harmony with it being the work of God alone, the work of God, the Holy Spirit. And so much is this the case that we must be able to say wherever you have true sanctification, there you have all, always, and there you have truly always the work of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ alone. He is the author. He is the finisher. He works all of sanctification by himself alone, according to the grace of God in Jesus Christ himself. And that is what must define and occupy my speech this evening. But also, secondly, there is a very strong parallel between the work of sanctification and another work that precedes it in the order of salvation. That is the work of justification. Now, it must be merely not enough to observe in the relationship between these two things that justification is first. And justification itself provides the ground for the further blessings of salvation, including sanctification. But we must go further. We must say, just as much as the object of justification is the sinner, dead in his trespasses and sins, so is sanctification also wrought by God according to the truth of its object, the sinner, dead in trespasses and sins. And therefore, sanctification is not to be shared between God and man, man is regenerated, man is renewed, man is converted, but from God and of God alone. Secondly, the point and the reason why sanctification must follow justification is that it is in the blessed knowledge of our forgiveness is in the blessed knowledge of our redemption by Jesus Christ alone that we pray to God for the blessed gift of sanctification. And that we understand 
that all the work of sanctification proceeds according to its ground, finished in Jesus Christ himself. And that therefore, in all our sanctification, we are recipients because of God's grace and mercy in Jesus Christ alone. In this respect, we want to see how justification or sanctification is identified as this work of making. It's very clear, clearly laid out, notably in Lord's Day 1. Question answer 1. The answer to the question, what is thy only comfort in life and in death? Look at the end of that answer in Lord's Day 1. And that by his Holy Spirit, that is Jesus Christ to whom we belong, by his Holy Spirit he also assures me of eternal life and makes, and makes me willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. That same truth is reflected in the heading of the third section of the Heidelberg Catechism, the question and answer 33. Take very careful note of that question as it is given to us in that Lord's Day. Why must we then do good works? We've been justified. We've been delivered by grace alone, without any works that we have done. Why must we still do good works? The answer is directed toward that word must. And its end is not a potential, not a possibility, not merely a manner, not merely a way, but good works themselves. Why must we do good works? Because Christ has redeemed us by his grace, also renews us by his Holy Spirit after his image, so that the must of good works themselves is holy and completely our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now it is our object this evening to see how the Holy Spirit is exactly that Spirit by whose power our Lord Jesus Christ renews us after His own image, and that renewal as the necessity of our lives of good works. So first of all, we look at the eternal God, secondly, the Holy Son, and finally, the Holy People. The eternal God, the Holy Son, and the Holy People. What we want to do is see how in each of these points, the Holy Spirit is the sanctifier, and who is the sanctifier as the one in whom there is this divine, godly, holy fellowship and communion. So we begin in eternity. We begin with God himself. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The three. Three persons in the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, the first thing that we want to see about this relationship of God as the triune God is the character that is identified in the names of the first two persons of the Trinity themselves, the Father and the Son. You might speak of these words as the, the relationship of the begetter and the begotten, or the speaker and the word. We must also identify by those words themselves a relationship. What is that relationship between the Father and the Son, but that of love, that of fellowship? The Father rejoicing in the Son, the Son rejoicing in the Father. And that relationship identified very clearly in such passages as John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 with these words, with God. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. 
And the Word was God. Verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. Further along in John chapter 1, verse 14, we have these words, the, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. In the bosom of God signifies that loving, affectionate, desirous fellowship and friendship of God. It is that love that is the power of the Holy Spirit. Think of that. One person of that Trinity is the love of the Father and the Son. So that when you read in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, with God, there is the Holy Spirit. So that you cannot say John 1, verse 1 and John 1, verse 2, or John chapter 1, verse 14, is simply about the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is right there. As being the withness of the Father and the Son as being the one that binds the Son within the bosom of the Father, to have this Word of God be the full revelation of God. To see Him is to see the Father because He is the one that eternally dwells in the bosom of God. There is the power of the Holy Spirit. Now it's for us to understand exactly what that power of the Holy Spirit is, in this relationship. What is the point of the personal property of the Holy Spirit? What is the point of His glory in this relationship of fellowship and friendship between the Father and the Son? It is this. The Holy Spirit is of such a bond and of such a communion that by the Spirit's presence, by the Spirit's personal property operating among the persons of the Trinity, the Father and the Son, it is not the Holy Spirit that dwells in the bosom of the Father. It is not the Holy Spirit that is with God, but such is the efficacy, such is the power and might of the Holy Spirit, that it is the relationship between the Father and the Son. This is what we must see as carrying its vast and great implications for all the holy will and counsel of God, including that will and counsel of God that is determinate for all your sanctification. What lies in the eternal counsel of God behind your sanctification? that rules it, controls it, and directs it? What is it behind all your salvation that makes it part of God's will and counsel? It is this. It is not that the Father and the Son have to come to some kind of agreement, that there's some hesitancy on the part of the Father or the Son to do something and they're rather reluctant to do it until they're promised something in return for it. It's a legal or legalistic way to view things. That this pact and arrangement is simply made because it has to be sealed, has to be promised and somehow guaranteed for the father or the son to do his part, that they're going to get something back in return for it. The truth could not be further away. The counsel of God is all love. It is all communion. It is all fellowship. You look at these first words of John chapter 17, the approach of Jesus Christ making intercession for us as our head, as he prays to God. The beauty of these opening verses is the fellowship 
of the Son toward the Father, reflecting on the fellowship of the Son toward the Father, gifts given to him, and his delight, with no reluctance at all, to do all the will of God that God has given to him, out of love and delight to glorify the Father in all his work, and seeking that the Father glorify him for the glory of God himself altogether. This is the glory that is demonstrated so beautifully in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, following the beautiful promise of knowing that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. This is the root of that promise of God. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he, the Son, might be the firstborn among many brethren. The glory of Christ, the Redeemer and Savior, magnified among many brethren as the firstborn among them, is the purpose of God. We look then at the opening verses of John chapter 17. The purpose of Christ coming into the world as his hour. Glorify thy Son, the love of God to glorify the Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. The glory of the Father from the Son. The glory of the Son from the Father. For the purpose of the glory of God. Down to this in verse 3. And this is life eternal that they might know thee. The only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent for the glory of God. And the entire work of Jesus Christ, to do all the will that God had given him to do, and all his earthly work, is described in verse 4 in these beautiful terms. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. We have this word of fellowship in verse 8. I have given unto them, that is the disciples, the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Then the summary in verse 10, All mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now it's important for us to understand next how this is worked out how this fellowship of the Holy Spirit is specifically and distinctly worked out in this earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. How was it that Jesus Christ could say all that he said in these opening verses of John chapter 17? How was it that he glorified the Father in all that he did? How was it that he might say in John 17, verse 19, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. What was the sanctification of Jesus Christ that he underwent? An amazing thing to think about. Here is the Holy Son of God, without any sin at all, the second person of the Trinity, the mediator in his human nature, consecrating himself to God. What does that mean? What does that signify? It is, most importantly, eternity reflected in time. Eternity reflected in time. The bond of the Father and the Son, namely the Holy Spirit, that particular glory of the Holy Spirit as sanctification, made clear and evident in all the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, to understand sanctification, as the work that Jesus Christ himself described. I have glorified thee. 
The sanctification was this then. Christ had constantly, Christ had always one aim before him. And all that he did, and all that he said, and all his earthly ministry, one aim and one goal. Never himself. Never self-satisfaction. Never self-gratification. Never earning, never meriting for himself. We had before him in his sanctification his Father. To serve him and to glorify him in all that he did. And this great work of Jesus Christ is featured prominently the Holy Spirit. It's an interesting exercise to take up. When you read the Gospel accounts, to think of all the ways that the Holy Spirit is mentioned, all the ways that the Holy Spirit's presence is indicated, it becomes evident that every facet of the life of our Lord Jesus Christ was governed and controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now, I think one of the reasons why it's difficult for us to comprehend it or think about that so much is that we think of the relationship expressed so often in the Bible between Jesus and his Father in heaven was simply there, we might say, by itself. Very directly, it's expressed over and over again. Directly, it's not only expressed on the lips of Jesus Christ, I and the Father are one, but very often it becomes the very point of contention itself in Jesus' miracles and teachings. Who sent him? Who does he serve? In whose behalf does he speak? What is his authority? What is his power? But you must understand exactly in the way that Jesus Christ is eternally in the bosom of the Father, is eternally with God by the operation of the Holy Spirit, that third person of the Trinity, so it is in all of Jesus' earthly work, in all of his ministry as the mediator. You might look at several points of the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is true of Jesus from the very beginning, as according to his incarnation, in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Luke 1, verse 35. How? How is Christ to be conceived in Mary's womb? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. By the operation of the Holy Spirit, consecrating that human nature taken from Mary, herself a sinner, herself having within her her total depravity, the Holy Spirit's work was absolutely necessary to consecrate a human nature for Christ to take to himself and to give, to join Christ to the human nature was the working of the Holy Spirit. This is a testimony of Jesus' childhood in Luke chapter 2, verse 40. The child grew, waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him through his childhood. This is a testimony of Holy Scripture of God the Holy Spirit about Jesus Christ in his childhood. We are familiar with his baptism by John in the Jordan. Taking upon himself the office given to him by God at his baptism, the record of Jesus' baptism signifies his position, his role, his calling, his office as the Christ. The Anointed One, having a testimony of God the Father. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. A testimony of the Holy Spirit coming down upon him in the form of a dove, 
consecrating him, not only separating him, distinguishing him for his office as the Christ, the mediator, all that he was to do, but also to give to him the Holy Spirit, equipping him, enabling him, guiding him in all his sanctification unto God. This was one of the great debates about his earthly ministry and all that he did, according to Mark chapter 4, verses 21 through 30. How was it that he spoke? How was it that he exercised authority even over the demons of hell itself? What they had to say as he taught and as he preached. As they said, he cast out devils by the power of Beelzebub. As Christ had to make clear, that sole power by which he did all his miracles, that power by which he preached, that power by which he cast out demons, was the power of the Holy Spirit, equipping him, strengthening him, guiding him, and leading him, not simply to do this work and to carry it out, to complete it, but to do so wholly and solely to the glory of God. This is the mention that is made in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, about the atonement made by our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Hebrews 10, verse 14, there the comparison is made to the blood of bulls and goats, that sanctifying to the purifying of the flesh in verse 13. Verse 14 has these words, How much more, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God? How much more? But then that blood set out, made the object of this statement, that blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, how much more shall that blood purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? In that blood, as shed by Christ, sanctifying himself to the Father through the eternal spirit, it is that blood that sanctifies us and purifies us to serve the living God in holiness. We take note of this of the significance of this knowledge of the Spirit's work. This is the real consecration of the Son to the Father. As noted before, this is the personal work of the Holy Spirit so wrought powerfully as communion and fellowship that it is the Son's real, true, glorious sanctification to the Father himself. Such is its power. This is the love and devotion of Christ to do the work that the Father gave him to do. All out of love, all out of delight, to do what was pleasing to the Father. True sanctification. The second thing that we must observe is that this is the sanctification of the entire human nature of Jesus Christ. That's a point that we have to carry through to the third point. Jesus Christ, holy, completely sanctified by the Holy Spirit in every part of his human nature and all the obedience that he rendered to God doing perfectly the will of God. His ears consecrated to hear what God gave him to do. His heart consecrated with all the love of God and desire for God's glory to carry it through. Fully performing, wholly accomplishing all that will of God with the speech of his lips, the deeds of his hands, the ways of his feet, 
all in the service of his God so perfectly as consecrated by the Holy Spirit. So that Jesus might bring all of his work before God in John chapter 17 and state in all confidence, I have glorified thee. I have finished all the work that thou hast given me to do. As his hour was now come. And now we must remember, most importantly, that scripture allows no kind of division here. There is no kind of difference that would lead to a stated independence. There is no division that would have Christ saying, well, I was given the Holy Spirit to do this and this and this, or I was given the Holy Spirit to work in this part and that part of my nature, but here I had my own thing that I did independently here or there or in this or that part of my nature, and that has to have respect to before God. That would be contrary to the spirit that consecrated him. It would be contrary to his holiness and to his righteousness. All for God, his Father, even on the part of the Son of God in his human nature. And who would ever suppose that even as the scripture accounts speak of the spirit driving Jesus Christ into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, driving him into the wilderness, that one would say, well, that makes of Jesus a stock and a block. Or that makes Jesus merely, only, thoroughly passive. So that Jesus really did nothing at all. Impossible. This is our mediator. This is our head. As the servant of God, sanctifying himself. Now it is in the same respect that you and I must know the working of the Holy Spirit in our sanctification as members of Jesus Christ himself. The Heidelberg Catechism itself in Lord's Day 12 identifies this truth of our sanctification very clearly with its question, Why art thou called a Christian? Why art thou called a Christian? The important thing to remember is that this is taken up in Lord's Day 12. Lord's Day 12 that speaks, first of all, of the office of Jesus Christ as our mediator, and of him first as our priest. Sanctification. The point of a priesthood, being sanctified. This is about Christ, and to be our only high priest, who by the one sacrifice of God has redeemed us and makes continual intercession with the Father for us as that priest. Now, question and answer 32 follows by asking, why art thou called a Christian? There is Christ. You are the Christian in Christ. Now what does that mean then? I am a partaker of His anointing. I'm not anointed next to Christ. I'm anointed under Him with His anointing. I have been anointed with that same Holy Spirit, now as the Spirit of Christ, incorporating me into Christ, joining me to Him, making me a partaker of Him, with this result, so that I may confess his name and present myself a living sacrifice of thankfulness to him. And also, that with a free and good conscience I may fight against sin and Satan in this life, and afterwards reign with him eternally over all creatures. This is the glory of the Holy Spirit in our sanctification to make us Christians, so that as a result and a consequence of his work, we offer up ourselves as living sacrifice to God of thanksgiving. 
There's something that I was going to mention earlier about the power of the Holy Spirit that must certainly be applied here as well. What is the Holy Spirit? As the invisible bond of communion of God. What is that Holy Spirit? That word spirit refers to breath or to wind. Namely, that breath or that wind is having two properties. It has a certain definite power. And then secondly, it is invisible. One of the best illustrations for this is something that children can very easily understand. It is a boy's birthday. He's given a birthday cake with the right number of candles on it. And he blows out the candles on that birthday cake. He musters in all the wind that he can into his lungs. He violently pushes out that wind through his pursed lips to project that wind as much as he can to blow out those candles. You watch those candles, you watch that boy, you say, well, there he is. He's huffing, he's puffing, he's blowing through those pursed lips, and then the flames in those candles, they go, they're up, and then they go sideways, and then they go out, they're extinguished. I have to say, how did that happen? How did those candles go out? Great mystery, right? He blew them out. I didn't see it. I saw his body. I saw his lips. I saw the candles and what they did. But where, where's the connection between those candles going out and his blowing? Well, you couldn't see it. It's air. It's forced. It's a pressurized amount of air that's sent from the lips of that boy to the candles on the birthday cake. So it is with your my sanctification. What do you want to see? What are you going to look for? There is God in heaven. There is Jesus, the Son of God, at God's right hand, sending from heaven his Holy Spirit. What comes with that Holy Spirit? Jesus Christ himself, your Savior and Lord, with all his power of sanctification to sanctify you. How do you expect that to work? Not in a way that you can see. Not in a way that you can feel. Not in a way that you can understand. And that's why it is so, so very important to know it's truth and it's fruit. It's truth and all its effects. Every last one of them, down to all the good works that you do in your entire life, is all from Christ and all from the operation of the Holy Spirit. This is quite simply the truth of what the Apostle Paul declares in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Sanctification in every way and every respect is Christ in you. By the Holy Spirit doing his work. You in him. He in you, that is all the power and that is all the glory of all your sanctification. I have to, I should give credit where credit is due to a book written by Sinclair Ferguson called The Whole Christ. The Whole Christ. It is the Holy Spirit that communicates the whole Christ to you and me to be all our sanctification from beginning to end. I want to take in the speech that truth further than Sinclair Ferguson took it in his book. 
But we must begin in this way. The gospel. The preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that alone which gives to you two features essential in your sanctification. Two essential features. Number one, justification. Not justification out there somewhere waiting for you to do something to get it, but justification in your heart, there by the power of God's Word and Holy Spirit, for you to know as God's forgiveness of your sins in the blood of Jesus Christ, so that you have gratitude. Full gratitude for full salvation given to you by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, operating not apart from you, not away from you, but in you, in your heart. This is why assurance is so important according to all the teaching of the Heidelberg Catechism. Many ways could be said. This among them, section, the second section deals with your deliverance, including your justification. All before the third section of good works, including your sanctification, including your conversion, including your regeneration. Section 2, before section 3. Very simply put. The second gift of the gospel is the joy of your salvation. Again, in your consciousness. Wondrous, glorious deliverance from Satan's hand, from Satan's kingdom. Condemnation, guilt, the judgment of hell. Brought near to God, the living and true God. The God of your righteousness in Jesus Christ, giving you the joy of your salvation to be your strength to fight against sin and Satan, to live unto God. But it is that same whole Christ that is given to you by that gospel through faith that is the Christ of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Your wisdom your righteousness, your sanctification, and your redemption through and through. I want to see that ladder according to its truth. What is the sanctification? It is this in its substance. From that gospel, you have Christ as your strength. You have gratitude. You have joy to hear God's law, not with your own ears, but with the ear of Christ in you. You come to love that law of God in your heart, because there in your heart is the heart of Christ, applied to you by the Holy Spirit in communion with Him. It is your mind, then, that seeks for opportunities to love God, to love your neighbor according to His Word, by that mind of Christ, in which you are sanctified by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is that life of Christ, applied to you so powerfully as the communion of the Holy Spirit, in Christ, that your hands, your eyes, your feet, your lips, your ears become instruments of you as the priests of God, sanctifying the Lord your God, as Christ sanctifies you by His Word and by His Holy Spirit. So that as you live these lives as consecrated priests to your God, serving Him, walking in His fear, you know every day where it all comes from. Nothing of yourself, but all of the grace of your God 
your Lord Jesus Christ, by the operation of your of his Holy Spirit in you. That is your strength. That is your joy from the gospel of your sanctification in Jesus Christ, your Lord. Thank you. Let's sing now Psalter number 300 or 112. One hundred twelve, taken from Psalm forty, a psalm that belongs first to our Lord Jesus Christ in his consecration to God through his Holy Spirit, then to us in him, and that to also through the operation of the Holy Spirit. We keep that in mind as we sing the four stanzas of one hundred twelve. You may be seated. I was told I needed to answer any questions you might have, so uh, feel free to fire away. I'm tempted to say good and let you all go. Sure, ma'am. 
sanctification is by the Holy Spirit alone. And Lord's Day 24 speaks of that we are made partakers of Christ and all his benefits by faith only. I include in that sanctification as that benefit of Christ. Um, could you develop that a little bit or speak to that about how sanctification is by faith alone as well? Good. Good. So, so the question raised that I was asked to repeat the question. The question raised is how sanctification is by faith. I think the first thing that I want to say is that it's the same truth. I'd say it's the same point, but two different sides of it. From God's side, it is completely and solely the administration that is the working of the Holy Spirit to give us Christ. The other side of that coin is how we see it, how we understand it, how we deal with it, that is, by faith. Now here, secondly, and to develop it a little further, is the, the beauty and the glory of Lord's Day 7, and it explain, how it explains to us what is true faith. When question answer 21 answers the question, what is true faith, that's not what faith is first of all. That's faith as sprung up in our conscience by the operation of the Holy Spirit, who has already implanted us into Christ by regeneration as the subject of question and answer 20 of that same Lord's Day. Only those who are engrafted into true Christ and receive his benefits by a true faith. Then 21 follows through by asking, well, what is true faith? Now, the benefit of the Catechism's instruction at Lord's Day, putting these two things together, this assured confidence and a certain knowledge, is that that certain confidence and true, true knowledge is the product of the union with Christ identified in question and answer 20. So that as you and I possess in our consciousness this certain knowledge and assured confidence, we know that it's the work of the Holy Spirit in us and not our work. And a pivotal point, thirdly, I think that's the most important, is that sanctification by faith is the assurance on our part, that sanctification is that which we receive. It is not what we do. Faith ensures that sanctification is completely of God alone, that is not, as it said, synergistic, God and man working together, cooperating together, but it is monergistic, God alone working it by His grace. Does that... Answer your question? Okay. Uh, anything else? Other questions? Yeah, John. I noticed you Yeah, what number was that again? It's uh, 110. 
Let's, Let's see, that, that is, is um, one, one time, time what, what stands, stands again? again? Well, uh, sorry. sorry. The one you chose was one and 12, and that covers uh, verse 9 and 17. Mm -hmm. Oh, right, that, that is in 112. Uh, right, I, I understand. Okay, yeah, the last line of 112 there. Um, so the, the question is, why do we have these extra sentiments expressed in 112, the four stanza that aren't in, in the original psalm? I think partly it was the desire of musicianship to have it kind of balance out and thus kind of absorbing into uh, these words, the subject of prayer, as this psalm is predominantly a prayer, and kind of filling in uh, spaces left by the meter to, to fill, in, fill in the blanks. I think that's really all it amounts to. Um, but the, the salvation that um, God gives to us is reflected in the prayer that we raise for his mercy as those who are so so deeply in need. But I don't really see any um, any other kind of motivation other than trying to make the words fit the, the music. I don't know if that helps. Okay, we'll talk about it. Okay. That that's the best I can I can see for now. You know it you know on the other hand if you try to make something out of that well because I'm praying and to make prayer this, this thing where by I need to do this in order to get, get this. Well, to be honest, it's just not prayer. Prayer, prayer cannot be merit-based. Prayer is antithetical to merit. You pray to God of mercy. And, yeah, other religions... Islam is one. You pray to God. Prayer is meritorious. Christianity cannot be because it must be thoroughly religion of grace. God gives. And because God gives, that's why we pray. Because it's all by grace. Another question. Sure, sure, Carol. Right. Yep. So I, I think your question is really there would seems as we just think about it, there's certain preparatory actions that are necessary to engage the spirit or to, to get the spirit moving. Would, would, would that, that be a fair way to put it? Okay. okay. Um, I, I used an analogy in Edmonton a few Sundays ago. You know, at, during church, the minister sits down for the offertory. He comes up to read scripture and the sermon. So I said, suppose during a worship service, I, I sit in the chair. The organ's done playing, collection's taken, and I stay there. I don't get up. I don't get up. Well, somebody's got to come up and say something to me, probably an elder, saying, Reverend, get up off that chair. Do what you're supposed to do. Read the Bible. Preach the sermon. And I'd say, well, I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit hasn't moved me to get out of this chair to read the Bible and preach the sermon. I, I, I prayed. 
I prayed for the Holy Spirit to give me the ability, the words to preach and so on. But I'm waiting. Well, get up. Preach. There's the Holy Spirit. Right there is the Holy Spirit. So to think of it the same way with Christ. Christ didn't wait for the Holy Spirit to somehow prompt him. He did what he was supposed to do. He did what God gave him to do. So it must be that as we trust and as we know the invisible operations of the Holy Spirit, to know His presence, His power in every aspect of the good that we do from beginning to end. From the understanding, yes, this is our calling. This is what we're taking hand is from God's law as our guide. The opportunities are all there and to understand in it is our sanctification. Another way to put it is this. Pray for that sanctification. Pray. And when you're done praying, believe that God answers that prayer. When you get up, when you walk, when you serve, when you love, it's all there. It's not in some uh, special moment or special feeling that you get and say, well, there's, there's the Holy Spirit. And to know, say, a child of God struggling to obey and serve God all his days, never feeling himself to be special, never feeling himself to be uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, moved by the Holy Spirit, and yet taking up his labor day after day in the fear of God, that's, that's a sanctification. Does, does that help? Okay. Other, Other questions? questions. Not, Not missing, missing anyone? anyone? All right, All let's close, close with prayer. prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, the giver of every good and perfect gift, we give thee thanks for the glorious and the blessed gift of thy salvation. To know that salvation as fully and completely ours in the person of thine own only begotten Son. To know the power of that administration, the salvation to us by the power of thy Holy Spirit, giving to us Jesus Christ himself to be in us, to incorporate us in him by true and living faith, that out of faith alone, we might live and walk before thee, to be thy handiwork, renewed in the image of thy Son, to glorify thee and praise thee. And so we pray thee, for the sake of thy Son, Jesus Christ, praying for us at thy right hand, as he speaks before thee of his glory, that he has accomplished in our behalf. So remember us, to be near to us, sanctify us by thy word and spirit, we might more and more put off the flesh with all its lusts. That we might more and more deny ourselves, taking up our cross to follow after our Lord Jesus Christ. That we might more and more live and walk to the glory, the praise, and honor of thy name. We come to thee every day helpless. We come to thee every day knowing the burden of the depravity against which we fight all our days. We pray, turn us from sin, turn us to thee. Grant us the blessed knowledge of the gospel of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and the fullness of our forgiveness and righteousness in him, that out of joy, out of deep gratitude, we might delight to love thee and serve thee all our days. Grant us grace also in this fellowship as individual churches, as a denomination, to help one another in the cause of thy truth, in the cause of righteousness, to the glory and praise of thy name. We thank thee for our fellowship this evening. We thank thee for the instruction that we have received. Blessed we pray to our hearts and minds. May it strengthen us to humbly serve thee. So all this we pray and ask for the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name alone, amen. There are no announcements, so feel free to go.